Last time on Base Funk. Alice wants to be with her husband again. You will re-roll a new character if you touch that mirror. I may have stolen those things from Penny and don't want to go into the mirror, but we have someone that wants to go into the mirror, so it's fine. I want to try to go up to the door, and I want to see if Fat Boy Slim can rust the, the locks off. The four features of this room are the stairs, the spine, the chains, and the mirrors. And then she wants to stab her sword into the spine. Black, inky tendrils start to come off of the sword and reach towards it? She half angel. She is half angel, or, in d d terms, Asamir? The one that we just saw being made in the, in the room upstairs, was that on the artistic end of the scale? Absolutely. She's putting all kinds of flourishes. Uh, remember, Sylvia was paid in custom jewelry. Uh, this person knows how to do cool metal crafting stuff. Wait, what do you mean by true name people? Are you talking about Lady Nim and, uh, you know, Barry? Like, that's not even magic. That's like some, something else. You shouldn't do that. That's danger. And like, light cuts her off. You erase my memory of Grace. We undo your memory erasal. You tell us what the deal with this town is. We carry that burden and you re-erase your memory. You pass, you pass the burden on to us, but we forget Grace. I need something first. I need you all to enter the mirror and retrieve a family friend. Uh, the family friend is a, a, an Aladrin. His name is Martis Valamin. Are you happy to put Alice in the mirror she wants to go in? You've got yourselves a deal, avant-garde. I almost died this morning. Uh Uh-oh. I'm currently dying. Yeah, we're all dying. Except for me. But not in the regular way where we're all just slowly dying, but like in the more like immediate kind of dying. It's kind of tragic. Is it a good story or? Uh, Apparently I was dehydrated and uh, (laughs) I woke up in the middle of the night, went to the bathroom, and then I nearly passed out face first in the toilet. Oh my God. So that would have been a very uh, disgraceful way to go. Oh no. No one wants to go face first in the toilet. <laughs> what did you do? I just, I guess I just didn't drink enough water. And it was really hot out. I don't know. I mean, on the plus side, you wouldn't be dehydrated anymore. No, I wouldn't. I would have been very hydrated with a very, <laughs> oh, uh, <no. laughs> very bad quality water. So basically, that's like the Oregon Trail only set more modern. So it'd be like the Portland Oregon Trail, you know, where you just, you don't die from dysentery. You die from dehydration and passing out in your own toilet. So... Now I know exactly what it's like for those people who are on the Oregon Trail, where I'm just like, I also was dehydrated at one point. That's right. But they're like, so what happened with you? I was like, well, I drank more Monster Energy drinks than I did water that day. And, you know, it was really hot out. So that's what happened with me. Um, <laughs> so this is a weird way to start a Dungeons & Dragons podcast. Uh, so where we last left this adventure, you guys had struck a deal with Warden Light to retrieve... Mardis Valamin, family friend from his mirror prison, and in return, Warden Light will let you know what he knows about the barrier, will allow Alice to enter the mirror, and will let you leave because you will no longer know that he has a secret daughter. Saying it all out like that makes it seem like an extremely complicated deal, but Veltari basically just dropped it all in one thing. It sounded very, like, well thought out at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although there is quite a big mess in the living room, uh, Grace froze a bunch of stuff with the first frost to de- de-escalate the situation. Tea went everywhere. Yep. There was chains everywhere. It was like a, it's a big old mess in there. Uh, so that's, wh- that's where you guys are now currently. Dora's just casually sipping on her hot cocoa. <laughs> okay, yeah, you spent most of the confrontation in mist form. So Just casually, just cash, you know. I do know. Yeah, at this point, Roland is going to ponder the situation, and then Roland is going to say to Zoe, 
Veltari and I are familiar with what happens when we go into one of these mirrors, and while I'm fairly confident we should be able to resolve this situation, there's really no guarantee if you go in that you'll be able to get out. If someone is very dead set in their ways, it can be potentially insurmountable. I mean, it seems weird if I'm the only one who doesn't go, right? Grace says, uh, I'm, I'm not going. Yeah, but I mean, like, you're not an avant-garde, so I, you wouldn't need to go in. You're not part of this deal. Quiet, you. <laughs> Rude. Yeah, Zoe, where's your chill? Think I think I lost it back in that dark portal that you uh, opened up for us. Uh, is rude. <laughs> okay, everybody's going to call Zoe rude. I like it. Roland's going to, like, motion for Zoe to sit on the couch with him for just a moment. And he's going to say, maybe it would be a good idea to spend some time with Grace over there. I mean, she's been locked up in this tower for whole life, perhaps, and hasn't had much company to talk with outside of Warden Light. Yeah, I'm gonna eavesdrop and be like, yeah, Zoe, female friends are important. Grace looks around at the big mess of the, uh, like, basically ice and snow and overturned chairs and tables and stuff, and is like, I'm gonna have to clean this whole mess by myself. Zoe, if, if all four of us go into that mirror, and we aren't able to convert the inhabitant of it, we're all going to be stuck in there forever. If that happens, then that means that the avant-garde is gone. Do you think I should stay behind then, just to like make sure we don't all get stuck in there? Well, somebody's going to have to eat all the uh, the jam that Winnie's making at the very least. Good lord, no. <laughs> the, the tone Roland uses is clearly a jest about that point. Hopefully. I found out from Claire that I'm allergic to preserves. It might be a good opportunity to spend some time with Grace over there. I mean, she hasn't had anyone to talk to really outside of Warden Light for all these years. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound like I have much else I could do, so I might as well. I think if I try to leave the tower, Warden Light's going to have me, like, murdered or something. So this seems like a better use of time. Murdered is a uh, is a strong thing for Light to do. I think you'll be fine in that regard, but just remember, Zoe, I have a lot of faith in you doing the right thing, all right? Oh, uh, thanks, but I, I'm not worried. I know you guys will be able to do it. Roland just kind of lets out a deep sigh and then <clears throat> pushes himself up to gather his thoughts a little bit before heading towards the spine. So Zoe is going to stay behind with Grace. Uh, as Warden Light and the rest of the avant-garde uh, leave the living quarters and go back to the stairwell where Warden Light retrieves a mirror from the wall uh, with chains and brings it down to you. You notice that it is a, a very old-looking one, the most rudimentary possibly, and also from the very top, which you think probably means it was amongst the first, if not the first, added to this impressive menagerie of mirrors, but the chains bring it down and place it in front of your group on the staircase. Look at how crusty it is. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go in first? Cause uh I've 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 been here, seen there, done that, got the t-shirt, you know, already. Does any does anyone else want to go in first? Who who wants to take charge today? I hope we don't let you down in our excursion here, Light. Brother Hawklight, you couldn't possibly disappoint me more today. <laughs> uh, Touche. See, we, did, we did this once. We can do this again. You know, mirror breakouts. That's like our, our thing. Go on, Ro Roland. We got this. <laughs> on a technicality, you guys are actually the world's foremost experts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Plus Dora. So after that, Roland's just going to take a moment to gather kind of his thoughts and then walks forward to touch the mirror first. All right, as soon as your fingers make contact with the glass, Roland vanishes. Ah, uh, here we go again. Geronimo! And I sort of just, like, you know, sprint, maybe do, like, a cannibal leap into it, just... Oh, I was gonna ask if I could cannibal. <laughs> well, you should have you gone in the mirror quicker. <laughs> See, I, I was figuring that, uh, that Valtari and, uh, and Dora were, were going to basically say, 
now that Roland's gone, let's go get baked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn, I didn't think of this. Uh, I guess you can still go get baked. Acrobatics checks to see who does the best cannonball. I rolled a 12. I rolled a 13. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Very close. You guys almost have- s- That's such bullshit. <laughs> you guys have almost the same exact form. Except for that one judge who gave you both a three, just <laughs> shakes their head, not impressed. My, my, my cannonball was just inherently better. Like, it's tough to pinpoint why. My, mine just was better. because you're taller. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, it just gave me that little extra momentum and that better arc that made me look like I cannonballed in just a little bit more stylishly. I was going to say bardish swagger. <laughs> that too. You guys leap through the mirror, um, and all three of you uh, are in another place entirely. And so allow me to describe it because I'm not sure what you were preparing for, but it is not what you find. What you find is you are in a wooded glen. Oh, this is exactly what I was preparing for. (laughs) Oh, dang. (laughs) It's a a beautiful field with butterflies and flowers and just enough tree coverage to shade you from the evening sun, but not so much that you can't see the beautiful blue sky above and the light dances on the ground and you guys hear the distant call of bird song and it's a beautiful, gorgeous, perfect outdoor scene. And you're almost like blown away by it because you were in this dark (laughs) forbidden (laughs) tower where you'd broken in and it was like all doom and gloom and danger. And you're just struck by just how gorgeous landscapes can be in a new in, like intensely beautiful environment uh but then you realize something's wrong and that something is you don't smell any nature stuff mm. it's just a sterile recreation of the images just like with Azriel's. well see that that was okay back in space because like <laughs> you know in space nobody can hear you scream and also you can't smell anything i think i thought you were going to say no one can hear you smell and i was going to <laughs> applaud you for that but i know i was so close to it i i didn't you're so close i i stuck the landing on my cannonball but i didn't stick the landing on that joke <laughs> sorry roland it's fine okay in space no one could hear you smell there you go are you happy roland moderately uh <laughs> Veltari and Theodora land on their butts on either side of you, Roland. How soft is it? It's a very soft landing in a... In a it is shrubbery. <laughs> a shrubbery with leaves like pillows. So Roland's just going to remark, just like Azrael's, it's an illusion concocted by the inhabitant. Yeah, but it's a pretty nice one. It's so soft! This is a prison of the mind, as much of it as it is the body. The mind gets to call the shots. Yeah, but that doesn't really sound like a prison of the mind. It's like, we're imprisoning your mind, but we're going to let your mind have free reign far more than it had in in reality. Uh, I need you all to make a perception check. Ooh, I like these. A four. 23. 22. God damn it, Can't quit beating me by one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Roland, you're you're too busy thinking about the wise old sayings and analogies of the great scholars, but your party members hear in the distance a rustling that starts off kind of distant, but is coming in your direction, and as it does so, it's getting louder and louder, uh, and it does not seem to be slowing down or stopping. Do we do that thing where it's like a dog heard a squirrel? (laughs) Yes. I I just want to note that I did hear it slightly better than Dora. You know, just just a little bit better. I just want to make sure we know I heard it slightly better. It's because you're taller. Veltari hears it, but with swagger. That's what the plus one means. <laughs> is the plus one now just the with swagger roll? Yeah, uh, if you beat someone by plus one, it is dot, 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 but with swagger. Okay. Um, can, can I do an acrobatics check to just like leap to the side into another bush that is quite soft? <laughs> if there's another soft bush out the way. <laughs> sure you can I feel like this might be unnecessary but um, I, I also feel like I would kick myself if I didn't 19 <laughs> yeah I mean you do a, a cartwheel into a bush <laughs> it wasn't a stealth check so it's not like you're hidden you're just in the bush now but well, it looked good if it was going in a like I don't know if this thing's moving in a straight line I'm just going to move out the way of where I was 
<laughs> All right, so Veltari's in a bush. Everyone else is kind of just standing in the middle of this scenic glen when into the clearing, a large figure approaches. Uh, I'm going to take Winifred away from our map on roll 20. He used to be the size of the entire map. That's a shame. Oh. Because something else is now in the clearing with you, and you can see it now. Oh. It is a grotesque, non symmetrical <laughs> giant. It's a huge towering creature with one bulging eye and one atrophied eye, one hugely muscular arm and one much smaller malformed arm. Its skin mottled with all kinds of warts and cuts and bruises. Uh, it's dripping blood from one hand where it scratched itself on uh, some sort of plant material as it was cr crashing through the underbrush. And in one hand, it is holding an uprooted tree. I've seen this scene from Left 4 Dead too. All we need to do with deal with, with this charger is wait a minute. There's only three of us. We're screwed. <laughs> um, I I don't need to do anything because I'm nice and safe because I'm in the bush. <laughs> yep, that's the, the first thing they teach you at at military academy. Step one: get in the bush. <laughs> get in the bush. Step one: oh, you're like uh, you're in the ocean. You see the enemy approaching. What do you do? Get in the bush. <laughs> uh, the giant thing which you do not know exactly what it is, opens its mouth to reveal a bunch of razor-sharp teeth covered in viscera, and it roars at you and raises the uprooted tree as it charges towards you. Uh, roll initiative. Oh, sweet. Eleven. Five. Wow, we got two elevens and two fives for initiatives. So first up is Veltari in the bush. <laughs> yes, because I get advantage over this, uh, this thing because I'm in the bush. <laughs> I want to cast Hypnotic Pattern. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> it, it's my go-to spell for big, chargey things that I want to buy us some time with. So, uh, Wisdom Saving Throw. All right, at the beat 15? Yep. 10. Is that going to do it? <laughs> no, 10 does not beat 15, unfortunately. Um, you are charmed for the duration. Charmed creature is incapacitated. Zero speed. The deformed, grotesque giant stops mid-charge to stare up at the huge hypnotic pattern that you throw up out of the bush, <laughs> and uh, its jaw goes slack, and it's staring at it, which means it is going to uh, skip its turn. Theodora, it is now your turn. I'm just going to go, hey, this is a really shitty prison. Why would you put this here? And I hope that uh, the dude can hear me, because I don't want to pull it out of its hypnosis yet. Ah, so you're hoping that the person whose prison this is that is hopefully not this creature can hear you shout. Yes. Performance check? Tw oh, a crit. Oh, snap. A crit. All right. <laughs> so you yell real loud, uh, why would you make this? <laughs> and from a different direction in this seemingly vast forest you find yourself in inside the mirror, you hear a different, much smaller rustling noise as something leaps from branch to branch in your direction. And you see a humanoid figure leap out of the tree line, uh, suspended in midair in a mighty leap before it vanishes in midair, teleporting up onto the giant's back, where this elven figure withdraws two swords, a rapier and a scimitar, and slams them down into the neck of the giant. Can I just say, did, did you say that he jumped onto the back of the giant? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, would that mean that he's now within my 120 feet, one minute uh, range of hypnotic pattern? <laughs> I mean, he was focused on the giant and not looking, but... Okay, someone shout at him. <laughs> someone, hey, loser. <laughs> All right, so you yell, hey, loser, to the guy who was trying to shadow of the Colossus you out of danger oh out of danger i thought he was trying to get us into danger no he stabbed the thing oh i <laughs> fine and he rolls a three which means with his swords buried in the thing's neck he looks up in the direction of the person yelling at him <laughs> sees the pattern and his jaw goes slack and now he is standing on the giant which has now just woken from its reverie because it is bleeding from the neck i can fix this <laughs> <laughs> Rolling, it's your turn, so. Dispel magic on hypnotic pattern. Uh, because it's a thir third level spell, it automatically gets dispelled. Okay, fine. This is me not paying enough attention to what the guy with the swords does. I assume someone turns up with swords and that they're bad and we stole them. 
<laughs> no, I like this. Like, it's a character moment for Altaria immediately distrusting anyone new. It's good. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of new people, particularly when they, they arrive on the scene brandishing weapons, and I quite like hypnotic pattern, so... <laughs> <laughs> it is your first line of defense. So, <laughs> Roland, you dispel the hypnotic pattern. That's my main action, so I am going to... He's going to basically draw his sword out and move up to be, well, adjacent to... Well, adjacent to the creature that the elf is perched on, t- on top of, basically to give it a different target to swing at. All right, Veltari, it's your turn again. I'm going to cast Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Oh, nice. All right, so I have to do a wisdom saving throw against 15 to prevent collapsing in laughter. Yes. House negative one. <laughs> Negative one, you find things so hilarious that, like, hopefully it's painful, and maybe you take some damage based on that. <laughs> Absolutely. So Roland runs up to try to draw its fire, and it tries to change its path, going from Viltari to Roland, and it just trips over its huge, big, dumb feet. <laughs> its dumb, giant feet. Its idiot feet. And it goes sprawling, and it is now prone. And since it is now NPC's turn, and the elf on its back is faster, it goes first, And he slams both of his blades down the rest of the way into the thing's neck. And then he withdraws them as the giant begins to collapse, not into blood and gore, but into strange geometric shapes as it kind of just falls apart like Legos (laughs) because it is not a real flesh and blood creature. As you guys figured out immediately, it is an imaginative construct of the mirror prison. Hey, loser. Sorry for uh, sorry for the uh, whole getting you fantasizing about magic lights thing for a second there. Hey. <laughs> the elf, or as you see, the Eladrin, because this man has no pupils, sheathes his two blades across his back. You see he also has some sort of weapon uh, holstered at his side. He's wearing like a belt and there's what you'd think is a, like a hunting knife uh, sheath. But the the handle on it is curved in a weird way. And I think in character, none of you really know what to make of that. But out of character, you would all realize it's a pistol (laughs) he has. Um, He sees you. You call him names again. And he says, in Elvin, I don't remember making you guys. You're mean. (laughs) Would Dora recognize this as the Feywild? Dora, roll me a history check with advantage because you're from the Feywild. I have a four and a 19. <laughs> Yay. With 19, not only do you recognize this as the Feywild, but you recognize this forest. It's uh, just outside of Mithrandain. It's a f- kind of famous uh, training ground for noble people and those of good standing with the archmages of Mithrandain. Um, and you spent some time on the outskirts uh, just getting in there and trolling and making funny business, maybe swiping some people's uh, personal belongings while they slept, <laughs> stealing their food. Roland's going to lift a hand and reply in Elvish, don't, don't be startled. We were merely surprised when we saw that giant approaching and weren't quite sure what we were dealing with. Uh, uh, oh, I mean, I, it's a, uh, sorry, uh, I'm Mard, I'm Mardis Valamin. Uh, uh, who are, uh, he then uh, tries to try some other languages because you're speaking in Elven, but he sees one of you as a tiefling and he says hello in Infernal and he sees another of you is a Nixie and he says hello in Sylvan, just kind of running through the different languages he knows. He tries uh, like four or five. I understood that in both of those languages. <laughs> in Infernal, I just want to say, I didn't think much of you when you first turned up, but uh, you speak Infernal, that's pretty badass, hey? Oh, uh, well, all, all the good graphic novels are in Infernal, so... <gasps> oh, we're going to get along well, I think. Hello, hello, hello. Part, part, of, me, part of me is going to be looking at the canon I wrote for this character and what you did with it, Austin. I'm going to be like, hmm. <laughs> authorial intent is dead, I guess. <laughs> He's a big reader. Listen. The, the death of the author is alive and well. <laughs> It says he's a big reader. I just I just changed up his habits. Listen, uh, for audience who may not know what's going on, this is uh, a character that is related to a character from last season. You don't need to know that, but if you think we're enjoying ourselves way more than we should be, that's why. But, but anyway, uh, Roland then just shifts to Common and says, Well met, Mardis. My name is Roland. Roland Hawklight. And he just extends a hand to shake. He reaches his hand out too, but very tentatively and slowly. It's You just saw this... 
guy take down a, a giant and you think, well, he's probably a badass, but he's facing you like kind of like a scared animal almost now. And he, he reaches out like almost not sure if you're real, mm-hmm. but he does take your hand and he says, uh, are, are you, you guys are real, right? Yeah, we're, we're real. Uh, his, I, I feel like we should give you some context as to why we're here. Like, here's the deal. Um, when you've done something strange and it wasn't very good and you get put in a mirror prison, who are you going to call? You call the, the mirror prison busters. We're going to, we're going to bust you out. <laughs> we are the, the world experts on breaking people out of mirror prisons and we're here to break you out of mirror prison. Did, did you guys defeat the angel? Defeat is a strong word. Defeat is an inaccurate word. That's what it is. <laughs> We defeated him in a game of wits that allowed us a uh, a deal to be struck. <laughs> That's a very generous reading, but fine. <laughs> That's fine. He wasn't. He wasn't here. He didn't know. We we are here on behalf of of light to. He yanks his hand out of your hand. Behalf is a strong word. It's not on his behalf. I'm not his friend. That it's you're still here on his behalf, even if you're not his friend. So, wait, he sent you? He wasn't even brave enough to face me himself? Oh, yeah, he's a ween. <laughs> Total weenus. <sighs> okay, here's his deal. He was not convinced that anyone could come out of these prisons. We went in into one and proved him wrong. We got someone out of one of these prisons. I think he's just like, he doesn't think he's up to the job. He respects, he respects the fact that we are capable of doing the impossible. So, you know, we're just the first port of call, obviously. And he's a weenus. And he's a weenus. <laughs> uh, Martis looks at you, Theodora, and he like nods approvingly. He also thinks he's a weenus. I, I put up a high five <laughs> to give Dora a high five. Yeah, we high five. No high five for Roland. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've we're in here, and we are basically gonna going to be here until well, we're able to get you out of here. You gotta feel in some way bad for something you did that got you in here, and ah, uh, we'll make that happen. I didn't do anything wrong. Oh, uh, neither did the person that I don't think the person we spoke to last time did anything wrong. But they eventually ended up feeling bad about it. Something to do with this this guy here. He plays a mean game of chess. <laughs> the other person we broke out murdered someone who didn't want to be killed. Yeah, but he have he have reason. Also, he's got to get brains from somewhere. Exactly. He's got to get brains. Person's got to die. It was a complicated issue. To say that he did nothing wrong would be a misstatement. Anyway, this is all beside the point. Sorry, sorry, Roland. Yeah, continue. I have one other quick, curious question before we delve into what happened. Martis, do you know how long you've been in here for? No, I mean, there's no day or, or, or night, and I don't sleep. And no. I mean, a long time. I tried to get out forever, and then it forever kept going. And so then I just, I'm just trying to keep myself busy and keep my skills sharp, just making things to fight and, you know, practicing trapping and hunting. And I mean, it's all against myself, so I don't really know if it's working, but it's either that or stare at the wall forever. So, you know, gotta stay positive. And this is a really just, uh, sh- mwah, chef kiss. Uh, this is just a really great recreation of the Feywild, by the way. It's just like home. Oh, are you from? Oh, cool. Nice. I lived in the swamp. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Near where all the, the fancy horses are, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Corndog Hamlet, that place. Corndog Copia, yeah. Have you imagined the swamp? Because if so, before we leave Dora, <laughs> I'd totally be up for seeing where you used to call home. Swamps are pretty, uh... They can be pretty all right. Wait, what? Okay, so you're from the Feywild. I guess I thought you all were just prime material. Are either of you guys from cool places? Uh, my ancestors might be. Oh, I didn't want to assume. Are you from? Are you? Are you from one of the the lower planes? Uh, not myself directly. I just kicked around on the prime material plane. But uh, dear old dad, as far as I uh, as far as I know, he's uh, yeah. Do you think he could sign my book? I have a book where I'm trying to get all the signatures from somebody from every plane. Well, uh, if you can find out who he is and, like, get me to say hi to him first, then, uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, oh, oops. Oops. My bad. Oops. <laughs> it's, oops. It's, it's cool. Uh, I, you know, I wrote some angsty songs about it. I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Sorry. That was awkward. I did bad. 
You were right. You're pretty endearing. I prefer if you thought I was like, cool, I do have like a lot of weapons and I just killed a giant, but endearing's fine. You, you, you remind me of someone that uh, you, you, you wouldn't know them, but uh, a, fr- a friend of ours called Winnie. You, 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 you're giving me, you give me Winnie vibes. <laughs> is, is it the voice? I, <laughs> I only have so many. So that's awesome. <laughs> But yeah, we we should we should get to like detective mode. Uh, wh- what did you do that got you in here? Whether you think you did anything wrong or not, what did, what what was the the reason they gave for putting you in here? I just wanted to talk to my uncle. He went missing, and well, I guess we knew where he was. Uh, the angel brought him to the weird light place. I don't. I just kind of thought I would walk in, and then I would push past him, and I grab my uncle and we get out of that place and then so all of a sudden it was chains and we were fighting and i got I... weird light place yeah the big colorful rainbow tube oh, oh. the city we live in mm. okay it's been a long time is it still a giant rainbow tube yeah we 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 are currently inside the giant rainbow tube still uh you are inside a mirror which is inside the giant rainbow tube it's like a frame narrative that's how long has it been as far as we know, the uh, aurora surrounding Ilium has been up for at least 50 years, perhaps a little bit longer than that. Oh my gods, Corellin alive, what, 50 years, is, is Uncle Luke okay? Ugh. Uncle Luke? Oh, you mean, you mean, you mean Lucas. Y- yikes. Oh. I, uh. I, I regret to say this, uh, Mardis, even though we just met, but... Oh no no no! Lucas no. has Lucas's time has passed for quite a while. It might have even no. been for decades. No, I didn't even get to say bye. Uh, Dora's gonna pat him on the back and be like, "I'm sorry, bro. Light's a real dick bag." <sighs> then why are you working for him? Oh, n- uh, so he doesn't kill me. Yeah, that was part of it. We also, like, someone wants to get into a mirror themselves. Like, we we went on, like, a weird <laughs> cross-section of missions we're on. Uh, you know, we, we, we got ourselves into a position where, like, we wanted something, he wanted something. It seemed like a good deal for you, because you get to get out of a mirror. Yeah, let's get out of here and kick his ass. Well, if you kick his ass, I'll put you right back in, so... And then you guys get me out, and then we'll kick his ass. Why were you calling Lucas uh, uh, Uncle Luke? He's not actually my uncle. He's a gnome. But our families are friends. My dad knew his, I don't know, granddad. It's a We age differently and also we're from different dimensions, which experience time in different ways. Uh, it gets kind of hard to track. So uh, To describe things from Light's perspective, what happened from his viewpoint was not so much that he was taking Luke uh, away from his family, but so much taking him away from a source of deep uh, grief over one of the inventions that he had made. I know Uncle Luke felt bad about the the firearms, and he like reaches down and kind of touches the handle of the gun holstered by his side, and he says, but he doesn't, he shouldn't feel bad. I mean, does the guy who invented swords feel bad? It's it's just a tool. What that? What? I'm gonna point out and go, what's that? What what is it? What it do? What that thing do? <laughs> he unholsters uh, the weapon and kind of shows it to you, and it's a it's a very ornate, uh, like almost steampunk flintlock pistol. It has like a lot of like gears and levers and stuff that <laughs> modern guns obviously don't have because this is like one of the first guns ever. Um, but he kind of shows it off to you and says, it's it's called a firearm. We also call it a pistol. <laughs> Piss. <laughs> nice that's even funnier in infernal anyway uh it there's an explosion inside and then it shoots something out very fast and, and then when it hits you you die oh fuck this is the future the old stuff is i mean no one's gonna use swords soon we're living in like i mean i already don't use swords so this, this <laughs> sounds like magic that i don't have to burn a spell slot on this sounds pretty all right Exactly. It's better than spell slots. You can just get pieces of metal. You can make them so cheap. A single person with a gun is worth a, a whole battalion of mages before they they even finish the finger wiggling. They're all dead. You say that, like, you know, this gun is so fancy. You did get immobilized, like, before you'd done anything in, in battle. So, like, you know, magic still, you know, has its uses. 
I mean, there were a lot of chains. And I mean, I did... I mean, I'm not super proud of this, but I did get a shot off. He's just... An, an angel? An angel, yeah. It's it's fine. Look, if, if you've got a problem with Warden Light, join the club. You're not alone. Yeah. Okay, I mean, all right, yeah, like I said, plan A, kick ass. I just... I know, maybe uh, not immediately kick ass. Like, maybe don't, maybe don't. <laughs> you, you say you you got imprisoned for going near the 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 aurora the big old glow and light tube i went in the tube i marched over to his tower i kicked the door in and then i tried to kick another door in and then he came out and then we uh, scuffled and rumbled and then i got chained you kicked it in you didn't like knock Someone kidnapped my uncle. What it? I'm um, kidnapped is perhaps the wrong. Maybe you have some wrong information, sir. Light decided, in order to provide him comfort at his time of need, to take him well into a place of isolation. They basically eloped. I mean, he said something like that to me, the big angel guy. I was, I said like, I'm here to help save my family, and he said he's my family now, and then I shot him. Um. Mm. Oh God! You shot! You shot! The implication I got previously was I'm being dragged away by chains. I fired a shot, not I kicked down the door and then and then shot, shot the him. angel. I mean, it's a little jumbled up. It's 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 not important. I I can't prove this one to you, but like I can tell you what Warden Light side of this is to like some degree, and I'm gonna be blunt with it. They loved each other, and the impression I get is that uh. Warden Light was trying to protect, uh, trying to protect Lucas from being taken back to somewhere he didn't want to go back to, and he saw you as someone that was trying to split up a happy relationship, and he did not want to let you do that. So, I'm just gonna put this on the table. If you were given a choice between what would make you happy and what would make your uncle Lucas happy, which would you rather? Well, he's dead now, so what does it matter? It matters, because if you were trying to take your Uncle Lucas away from where he would have been happiest through violent action, maybe that's a like, thing you could feel remorse for and like we could connect the dots and get you, get you out of here. I'm never going to feel bad about it. I was in the right. He wouldn't even let me see him. In that case, stage number two of our patented foolproof plan of getting people out of space, pr- uh, like, uh, space prisons, mirror prisons, uh, <laughs> this guy here plays a game of chess and like we learn some stuff and I'll probably <laughs> then like put two and two together and it will have been him that did the real leg work but I'll shout as if <laughs> I worked it out and then we get you out of the prison. Does that sound good? Wow, it's a real pleasure to watch your progress. Yeah, this is like this is our process. It's like I do the 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 brunt like jump in and see if I can guess the solution and Roland does the chess and then he works it out but I shout the solution as if I worked it out because he did the leg work but I thought about it a bit. <laughs> Yeah, this is actually my first time in mirror prison, so it's like I'm I'm training. Uh, this this is a bit jumbled, uh, Mardis. I get that impression. <laughs> Let's see if we can try to trace this a bit further back, if that's all right with you. I guess I mean I can show you guys anything in here. You can show us. Yeah, I mean, look, and he he waves a hand, and and there's a unicorn standing next to him, and it looks over and it says, "Sup." Corn dog. And he says, I, I mean, I, we can talk or I can just show you guys whatever. That's how this place works. I, I, I got some suggestions. Like, if, if I was going to, like, bullet point a list of what might be helpful to see, when were you aware that Lucas was leaving? That would be a useful thing to see. Uh, Yeah, I remember that really well. <laughs> I've seen it a million times. Mardis waves his hand and behind him the scene begins to shift and change as an audience chamber so large that you can't even see the end of it begins forming. Throne room is the first phrase that comes to mind, uh, except there are four thrones, three of which are empty and one which has a robed Eladrin figure uh, with a big regal looking staff. And he sits in one of the, the thrones in this kind of audience chamber, I suppose you'd call it. There are several columns that kind of lead you down the path to the thrones and there are guards by each column it's like clearly a huge big important room and in this image martis says to the seated figure in the robe dad i i I mean i'm gonna go you can't stop me luke's in trouble 
And then the, the seated figure in the robe, an older Eladrin, still an elfish figure with no pupils, uh, responds. I know you're very insistent on helping this capacity, Mardis. However, the information we have is fairly sparse and almost absurd. A family member of the Rosemary's being approached by an angel. That's not how Garl Glitter Gold operates on things. Why would he approach one of the more famed members of the Rosemary family and then leave with him? You know that Uncle Luke had been less uh, less involved in the past few family reunions, but I don't think any of us suspected it was that dire. It's got to be some kind of trick. Like, everybody wants him. He's the world's most famous inventor. Mm -hmm. It's probably some other company, and they're trying to steal his ideas, or maybe the other religion is trying to get him so that he can be, like, a spokesman or something. I don't know. You have all the information. I'm just going to go get him. I suppose we can make this sort of a first assignment for you, see how things go. I will suggest that if things start going awry, that you contact me immediately to let me know that if things are either getting out of hand or if we need to rethink our approach, then I and the other Archmages can summon up a portal and bring you back over here. Of course. That's why I learned sending. It's I can reach you anywhere, anytime. It's This is foolproof. That's some good expository <laughs> character re revelation there. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. It shouldn't take you that long. So... All I can say is just please be careful. The material plane moves in mysterious ways relative to ours, and every time we visit, things seem to lurch forward in surprising ways. You'll be surprised. Most of the ways you're supposed to introduce people change. You go in for a handshake, their hand closes into a fist, and then you're suddenly grabbing their fist. It gets a bit <laughs> awkward, is all I'm saying. I knew I should have taken etiquette, but I mean, there's so many better electives, Dad. We're not going through this again. Fine, fine. Well, since you're insistent on going, let me give you what I took with me when I first headed out into the material plane on my own. At least this time you're giving me a, a, a warning, unlike what I did with my parents. <clears throat> and then the, the figure withdraws two sheathed swords, one being a rapier, one being a scimitar. And he offers them to Mardis and says, Mother complained a little bit when she realized why I took these four, but I at least feel like I'm putting them in good hands here. Oh, geez. I, I probably should leave as quickly as possible. She's, she can kick the snot out of me. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Even at her age, yes, she can. <laughs> in any case, I trust you to do this as well as you can. And once you come back here with Uncle Luke and everything's in order, maybe we should have just... Another family reunion. It's almost it's been too long since we've had a rousing party with the Rosemary's. As the robed figure says that, the scene freezes and Mardis in the flesh turns to the rest of you and says, uh, does, does that help? Can we leave now? Roland. <laughs> uh, yes. This is the bit where you usually do the chess. <laughs> do you want to do the chess? Because the chess usually like gives, you know, I rag on you doing the chess, but you it usually gives us some answers and some insight. Like I can't deny that it's usually a pretty insightful way for us to to move these kind of things along. Wait, the chess is actually useful. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> hey, you're the pro. You you got my good tentacle boy out. Martis, uh, could you conjure up a table for us here? <laughs> he does so. Um, it's a really nice table. You assume he just picked uh, a random rosemary uh, building because everything here looks very nice. And he sits down at the table and he's going to make a roll. 22. Mm. Bring it, Metal Dad. <laughs> metal Dad. That's cute. 17 on my first go, so. <laughs> he goes, okay, so I beat him. Does that mean I can leave? No, no, no. Listen, listen. For someone who has been in here for as long as you have, and I have a good feeling for how long you've been in here, you don't want to rush out too quickly. I mean, I am in a hurry, but I am also kind of, if I can be honest, enjoying the contact with other people and the talking. Like, I go for what must be weeks without hearing a voice, and it's, uh, well, it's bad. There's bad times, but I'm just sorry if, I'm, if it seems like I'm not taking this seriously. I'm trying to cope 
we're probably the first persons, well, not even probably, we are the first people you've talked to since you've been in here. I conjure people, so that's, that's embarrassing, don't say that. Um, so, what, what does the chest do? Is it a key? The chest is an excuse for Metal Dad to, like... <laughs> talk to you and i don't know what it is about the chess but something about when he's playing the chess he gets all introspective and he works out what he needs to do and then i like jump in at the last minute and say the thing out loud and we get out of prison i mean you know what helps me think what dueling Ooh, that's like chess but without being lame <laughs> yeah exactly i'll fight you do you want to fight i mean you look strong but i'd rather fight the strongest of you yeah, which is me. I, I pull out the sword. <laughs> I don't want to be mean, but uh, one of you is... Well, and he, he looks at Theodora. Me? You're... I mean, you're a... He, like, lowers his voice. He says, you're you're a drowner. Rude. Well, is that... Oh, that's what we call you. Is that... R- r- I didn't know it was, like, a slur. Sorry. Uh, It's not on purpose. What do you... Do you, like... Neck? Nikor? I don't know. What's... Uh, I like Nixie. Okay, Okay. cool. You wanna fight me? You have fey magics and... Oh, shit. We don't go to the swamp because people don't come back. At this point, Veltari is getting a little bit jealous that she's not considered the strongest, and I think she wants to, like, sum- summon the cool manticore out. <laughs> Thaumaturgy up, try and, like, make the place, like, shake, and her eyes are glowing, and just, like, everything's, like... Oh, oh, really? I, I triple my volume of my voice, I'm like, am I not scary enough for you? <laughs> Roller leads into Marsh, and it's just like, now you've done it. I'm gonna pull out Perry Mason. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he also isn't as scary as a manticore. Manticores are tough. He's he's classier. Intimidation contest to see who looks cooler. <laughs> Come on, with swagger. Come on. If she beats you by one. Twelve. Oh. Twelve. Whoa. <laughs> we both got twelve. Twelve to twelve. So you guys tie. Uh, do you want to roll again, or do you both want to just have it canon that you look you look equally awesome? I want to roll again. Yeah, I'm up for that. Let's roll again. This is like rock, paper, scissors round two. 20. Can't be scrub lord. 22. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the, Perry Mason looks awesome. And uh, what did we go with for the manticore? I like man eater. I, 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 I like man eater. Man eater's good. Uh, because we're too higher. Uh, I think that both me and uh, Man Eater both have swagger. <laughs> yeah, as I was saying, Man Eater flexes extra hard, and Perry Mason doesn't have the. You know what? I want to start. I want to start levitating. <laughs> oh, okay. You start levitating, and then Mardis casts levitation on himself. Oh, you can do it at will too. <laughs> it's useful for getting over obstacles. Yeah. Sweet. I feel like we're gonna be real good bros when we get you out of this mirror. <laughs> you know what this means, though, right? What? Midair duel. Oh, uh, shit, yeah. <sighs> Fine, you don't want to fight the scariest person. Fine. Fine, I don't I don't care. <laughs> the top of the building that he had created to set up this chess match flies off, and he just shoots up out of the building like a shooting star into the sky, uh, waiting for Dora for, his mid- for the midair duel. I shoot up there, too. All right, we're going to do Wild West-style initiative rolls. To see who shoots first, you have Eldritch Blast, and he has a gun. Oh, we're oh we're doing like old school duel. Sixteen. Eighteen. Nice. All right, so you guys turn your back. You do five floating paces, and then Dora turns and shoots first. Eldritch Blast me. You can describe it too if you want. It's finger guns. She just finger guns. All right. Eighteen for my attack roll. You have multiple. And seventeen. Eighteen and seventeen both miss. No. You shoot out two beams of eldritch energy and he pirouettes around them expertly and he returns fire with his flintlock pistol i'm very excited for the first oh. gun fired in the history of dice funk Ooh, and i'm gonna probably die 24 oh god uh that's the part where you usually tell me that it hits but i know it hits so it, it hits so hard uh 10 damage oh no <laughs> so he shoots you while you guys are flying through the sky, and he says, I win! Ow! 
Like, <laughs> <laughs> that hurt so bad it made her sneeze. It's canon. It's canon. It hurts so bad she sneezed. Wait, do, do Dixie sneeze when they get hurt in Dice Funk lore? I guess so. I guess they do now. This this one does at least. Mardis flies back down doing fist pumps. He's like, yeah, I won. And he says, uh, so do you want to do a, a little duel then, uh, cool manticore lady? I'll, I'll, I'll do a nice, uh, I'll do a nice ground, ground-based one. Why not? So I was just going to lay on the ground and go, ow. <laughs> Roland, Roland uses lay on hands to heal her up from that. Ow. Ow. Uh, initiative roll. 18. One. Mardis is like an inch off the ground. He's he's stunting because he wants to do a cool, uh, like acrobatic sword fight. He's just he's enjoying himself. He hasn't seen another person in fifty years, frankly. Oh sure, sure, sure. Uh, so Mardis won eighteen to one. I I wonder if like Veltari kind of like swaggers in and be like, yeah, I'm going to do a cool sword fight, and then he and just then trips. <laughs> <laughs> if she, I was thinking just more that she wasn't ready for him to be basically flying at her. You know, I, 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 like, you know, wandered over. I, I walked through a bush and as such assumed I'd be invincible. I was just, I just wasn't prepared. Uh, 25. I'm going to say that hits. Yeah, 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 that does. Uh, nine damage as he tags you with his rapier. He says, first blood. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yes, I have my manticore out. So, uh, I get free hellish rebuke, basically, don't I? Yep, so I gotta do dexterity save, because anyone who tries to hit you uh, causes the manticore ghost to fire spines into them. Oh, yeah, it's been a while since I've been hit by anything. Uh, 21, so he saves, but I think he takes half. Uh, Yeah, it takes half on a save, so. All right, roll me that damage. Okay, so that's five damage. All right, so he flies at you like a Dragon Ball character, runs up, taps you with his rapier. He thinks he's pretty cool when suddenly a ghostly spine shoots over and hits him right in the friggin' head. And he's like, first blood. (laughs) Ow, gosh. (laughs) Second blood, nerd. Get him, Beltari. He falls out of the sky and lands on the ground, not feeling as cool as he did a millisecond before he got domed. I like to think he lands next to Dora, and I'm just looking over, and I'm like, yeah, same. <laughs> While he's on the ground, I want to cast Vicious Mockery. Because <laughs> uh, it just feels thematically appropriate at this moment. Um, uh, you, you are so terrible at this. You, you didn't even realize I had a manticore that was going to shoot spikes at you. You're so, so terrible. I botched my charisma save, <laughs> which means your Vicious Mockery brings him to tears. <laughs> tried my best <laughs> uh five more damage which means i've done 10 damage which is more than he dealt overall <laughs> so you did one more damage just yeah. the same way you keep beating just my swagger point my swagger point of damage <laughs> the crocodile ter- tears turn to laughter as he is relieved <laughs> that he has interacted with another person <laughs> hey I-, I hope that wasn't too uh too harsh so let's cut back uh to zoe and grace who have been in the living room, cleaning up the icy mess from last episode. The, after the avant-garde went in the mirror, Warden Light came back in briefly uh, to get a blanket <laughs> to get back in his burrito form, and he has recovered the first frost from Grace and is holding on to it for safekeeping. But he leaves the two of you alone because <laughs> he, he trusts that Zoe isn't going to try anything. She can't leave, and she's going to lose all her memories of this anyway. So you, you guys are basically left on your own recognizance. Uh, well, I imagine we've spent some time trying to clean up as, uh, best we can. It's sometimes, I guess, difficult to get frozen tea (laughs) out of, you know, like a carpet out of the upholstery like that. So, you know, there's always so much we could do. I don't have prestidigitation, so, uh, you know, we we just, we we flip a couple cushions over and we we, we let that one kind of go, but, uh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, just try, just try to kind of uh, kill time, you know, while while we're we're cleaning up. And uh, Zoe's going to turn over and say, uh, "Sorry, by the way, if I scared you earlier, I didn't mean to. I was just, I'm not used to hearing other voices in my house. So, like, I know that, like, <laughs> I understand social cues. So <laughs> I know you weren't like attacking me. Oh, oh, I, you know, I just wanted to make sure. I didn't know." uh you know how how much you've you've kind of seen of the world outside of uh, this tower. <laughs> she she like looks around, even though she knows exactly where light is <laughs> conspiratorially, and says, uh, "I sneak out sometimes, but I like at night and you know in disguise usually." Yeah, I guess so. I mean, considering the uh, 
friend you've got over there that I saw you with when we came in. The feathered serpent ghost is kind of like trying to help, but is more of a hindrance. It just <laughs> keeps knocking stuff over with its big tail. So what's its name? I, mm. so it's a ghost, which means it used to be a live thing. And so I felt like weird about giving it a name because it had one. And I don't know what it is. I don't want to give it a different name. That'd be rude. Well, yeah, we're not like, you don't give it like a different name. It just gets this kind of cool name that it, it sort of represents itself with as it's now attached to you. You know, it just kind of comes to you. Like, I look at yours and I kind of think, free bird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was going to say tube snake boogie, but that's fine. That's not a, that's not a band. It's a ZZ Top song, Pleb. All right. Well, ZZ Top <laughs> is not my jam. All right. <laughs> i love you chris cz top stop making up artists yeah <laughs> we're from different generations um are we the same age <laughs> like are we, I, when were you born wait how old are you chris uh 28 i'm 26 so actually you should have a better idea of who cz top is than i do but that's fine i i i absolutely should you young kids and your <laughs> your rock and roll <laughs> Get off of my lord. Sp- uh, speaking of ages, Gray says, uh, so how old are you? Because we look like the same age. Oh, um, Zoe's kind of stops for a moment and has to like sort of think things through, which <laughs> you imagine sort of weird for somebody when asking their age. But she's like, I, I guess I'm still like 19. I'm not really sure anymore. Oh, golly. You grow real fast. I'm, I'm like 50. <laughs> I mean, part of it's because I'm, I am I sometimes just change when I cast spells and things like that. The physical body I have I, kind of has changed a couple of times since I've gotten to Ilium. I was actually looking like, uh, I actually looked like I was seven when I first got here. So like a baby? No, like, you know, like a kid. You're like a little baby. <laughs> like a little baby. <laughs> Where's all this shade coming from? <laughs> no, it's just like a little baby. <laughs> What's with his voice? It's just a little baby. What's with this voice? <laughs> Are you just gonna do the entire show with this voice? Now? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's just struck by the image of you as a little baby. She's not very well socialized. She, she also doesn't understand that people age at different rates, I guess. I guess. Yeah, uh, Zoe's just gonna say, like, I mean, I thought I was gonna be done with being treated like a kid now that I wasn't actually stuck in that body, but... <laughs> I mean, I just like the idea of you as a baby. I'm not saying you are a baby. You don't look like one. You look like me. Thanks, I guess, then? Do you have a ghost? Yeah, uh, check him out, and I'll, she'll bring out Fat Boy Slim. Oh, cool. I like all the legs. He's got a lot of legs. He does. Uh, he also eats some of the gold that I shot out randomly for a period of time. Oh, is <laughs> this a hungry guy? Yeah, well, uh, they, they're rust monsters, and they kind of eat, like, metal and things like that. He's actually, um, uh, she uh, kind of, uh, turns her eyes to over where Warden Light was. It's actually kind of how we got into here, because I uh, just kind of popped the locks off the door your dad had. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just I just used an unlocking spell to sneak out. You guys really went uh, the extra mile. Well, I mean, I could have tried an unlocking spell, but then I might turn into like a Tyrannosaurus or you know, cease to exist or something. I, I don't really know. Ele- a shark fell on somebody when I cast a spell the other day. I don't really try to, you know, use spells that wanton kind of willy-nilly. I heard about the shark thing. How did you hear about that? Dad was all real... Mm, he was quite a grumper. Is is your dad, like... What's he like to have as a dad? Warden Light, I mean. Uh, I mean, he's usually nice. He worries a lot. He's a He's a big worrier, but... I mean, he's nice. He seems like he'd just be sort of weird as a dad. I don't know. Maybe I haven't had many other dads, just the two. So I don't have a lot of comparison. How many dads do you have? <laughs> Some would argue none, but you know, <laughs> I just, you know, I kind of got like a weird vibe for Morton Light when I first met him. But I think it's maybe just because he reminds me a lot of my sister. You know, they're both just kind of so perfectly good and flawless sort of people. 
that you just kind of get turned off by it. In some circles, uh, people in interpret Roland crying a single tear at the comment of Zoe having no dads. So, <laughs> uh, depending on whose theory you believe in. So wait, you guys don't like my dad? Like I know he's mad at you because you snuck in, but I thought you guys were like his friend. No, I, yes. I mean, I, well, I, I can't speak for everyone else in the avant-garde, but I don't dislike your dad. I just found him kind of hard to talk to, and that's probably for my own reasons more than anything actually against your dad. I mean, I know he really likes uh, the big guy with the shield. Yeah, but everyone likes Roland. That's cool. I bet it must be cool to be him. <laughs> yeah, probably. He has a horse and everything. Nice. <laughs> ghost horse. Yeah, I guess it is a ghost horse. No, it's not. <laughs> it actually isn't, but, you know, that's... <laughs> so I was waiting for you to correct me. I set you up and you just accepted it. <laughs> Find Steed isn't quite a ghost horse. It's a... I mean, it's in the same way that Job really isn't a ghost, you know, magpie from last season, so... I know. I just like the idea that... um Retroactively, Zoe's been under the impression that Trinity's been a ghost the whole time. It, it wouldn't be that shocking if that's how it actually ended up going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Grace says to you, Dad really likes the big guy, but you're the... he. Mm, but he has uh, different feelings about the true name person? Who did that? Yeah, that was, um, that was me. Yikes. I mean... I'm going to have to live with the weight of every the decision I made for the rest of my life. So, yeah, it literally haunts me at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's not what literally means. Literally, the ghost in the sword, the soul that I accidentally got sucked into it, comes out at night and haunts me. Uh, a prompt appears over Grace's head and it says, Grace will remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Light pokes his head into the room just to see that you guys are still okay and cleaning. <laughs> and he puts the blanket away because he's getting anxious about waiting for the avant-garde to return. And then he goes back to the, the stairwell as you guys kind of like finish up straight, straightening the living room. Hey, uh, Grace, do you mind if I ask you a question? Sure. I just like talking with you. So you can basically say anything. <laughs> um, do you think the barrier around Ilium should come down? I mean, I want to go see, like, everything. Like, everything that's not, like, th these three rooms. <laughs> so, I, I think I'm biased. But, yeah, although my dad wouldn't like it. It's kind of weird. I don't... I came into Ilium thinking that the only thing that I should do when I'm here is make sure that the barrier goes down. Because that's all I wanted. But, now I don't know anymore. Yeah, I think about sometimes, like, what my papa would have wanted... Because he, like, he based the mirrors on the magic of the barrier. And he wants people to get out of the mirrors, but I don't really know if he wanted people to get out of the barrier. He never said. If he died here, wouldn't his soul still be inside Ilium somewhere? So, I mean, you guys do already know in character that ghosts don't necessarily retain anything of who they were. I was being dumb momentarily. Forget I said anything. <laughs> no, it's fine. She says, somebody let a bunch of ghosts out, and my dad had to put them all into a mirror. So he's probably in there, if he even would recognize me. And that I don't want to even know, because then I'd be sad if he didn't. And dad is very clear. You have to let dead things stay dead. So we're just going to say, so, um, hey, Grace, is, the, is there anything that you, like, wish you could do more often, or wish you could get more often? I really could use more books. I've read all the ones that are in here. There's not much to do besides make, make jewelry and mirrors and read books. Like any kind of book or mm. just like choose your own adventure novels. I'm like, oh, fuck, yes. <laughs> Have you heard of Goosebumps? She's like, I haven't. It's like, how did you even know of choose your own adventure books? Then those are the king of the fucking crop. <laughs> uh I basically like reading about anything new, like anything with like really good descriptions that make me feel like I can see things I haven't seen before. Huh. And uh, do you like, uh, I'm sorry if this seems weird. Do you like eat? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, okay, that is a very weird thing to say to another person. I don't know. Your dad's an angel. I don't know what he... I don't think he eats. Does he eat? I mean, I know I saw him drinking tea, but I like to think that's just something he does to make us, like, mortal creatures feel more comfortable. <laughs> he he can. He doesn't have to. I, I do, though. I'm a... I'm, <laughs> she, like, leans in. And she says, I'm a... I'm a person. I, I'm not trying to say you're not a person. I just don't know, like, if the... Like, celestial parts of you, like, make you operate differently, and I don't want to presume. You know your friend, uh, with the horns? Feltari. Yeah, I'm just like that. I'm like her, but like the opposite. In, in Zoe's mind, there's a very odd caricature being built now, where it's just like <laughs> the, like, uh, bizarro version of Veltari is what, <laughs> what she's saying she is. <laughs> what like inside out oh yeah, well, no like it's just like she plays like an upside down guitar and like <laughs> oh okay she, she plays viola not guitar yeah and it has like uh like the amish kind of like a uh, clothing sense like super preppy because like that's the opposite of punk rock yeah <laughs> okay what's the i didn't know amish was the opposite of punk rock i mean to me it feels like that's <laughs> adequate i thought it'd be like phil collins no, well no because i love punk rock and phil collins and obviously that can't be <laughs> hypocrisy of some kind no <laughs> she wears khakis yeah <laughs> yeah uh, veltari veltari joined in as zoe did the drum solo to in the air tonight obviously she loves phil collins okay <laughs> so we had kingdom of hearts jojo's bizarre adventure phil collins <laughs> well there's like what if we get the new york giants in this season if if this season ends with jo uh, Zoe joining New York Giants as their new quarterback, then yes, I, I I probably will just like ride off into the sunset. I don't think Eli Manning is a valid race in fifth edition, though. Uh, it's going to be now. <laughs> it's called the Goober race. <laughs> and you look very unmajestic as you throw footballs. And that is a deep track football joke that most people won't get. I'm sorry. Where were we? I don't get it. <laughs> I do. All right, so uh, is there anything you want to do before we close out this scene? Because I tried to bait you into talking about true names. You didn't bite, so that was what I had prepared. Uh, yeah, actually, there's one thing. Uh, she's going to say, so, like, do you like uh, like preserves or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like my favorite food. <laughs> I can't even do it. I'm laughing too hard. Yeah, it's like my favorite food. <laughs> Oh man, you should uh you should see it. There's uh, I know somebody in town who makes really good preserves. Like he has like strawberry preserves and cherry preserves and pineapple. I want to talk to Winnie now. Eat my entire butthole and dick, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> ooh, 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 nice, nice. I'm just gonna do that. Hey, it's your boy Winnie. What's up? Anything interesting going on in your investigation? Hey, Winnie, uh, I actually can't talk about that so much, and I have something really important to ask for you. I need you to kind of trust me on this, and don't ask questions. But, <laughs> I know, but I'm not doing something evil, I promise. <laughs> that was a suspiciously specific denial, but go on. I need you to write down something and give this direction to me when I come back to the avant-garde headquarters. Uh, okay. Um, let me get a pen. Okay, I'm ready. So uh, Zoe's gonna basically describe uh to Winnie that she wants the note to basically read. Sorry, that was really weirdly like a lot of fucking nothing there. Uh, she wants the note to say, uh, fuck, I can't think of a good way to say this first fucking thought. So, so I mean. Grace is staring at you this entire time as you sit silently and send messages back and forth. <laughs> you look like a weirdo. Yeah. Uh, well, that's fine. She always is going to. Zoe wants the note to say, drop off preserves and books outside of Warden Light's tower once a week or something like that uh, to some extent, uh, but, but, but leaves no other specifics beyond that. The only other thing at the very end she wants to say, it's for a good cause. Okay, this is a really weird way to tell me to give light care packages, but I got it. Anything <laughs> else? No, that's it. Thanks, Winnie. Okay, have fun. Or also catch the bad guys. Both. You can do both. Yeah, we're going to try to do both. I have to go now. Pineapple. <laughs> 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 and 
Grace is just like standing up and slowly backing away because it looks like you just had a fit. Pineapple marmalade. There's lots of them. There's a lot of really good marmalades that that person makes. <laughs> you might find some sometime. Pineapple preserves, pineapple marmalade, pineapple pizza, pine- like you just go through the bubble gum. Yeah, there, there's, there's pineapple juice and pineapple steak. Pineapple gumbo. Pineapple spaghetti. Cut to Woody freaking out and like breaking <laughs> things in the base as multiple phone calls are being patched in abruptly. It's his switchboard just melts. Um, though he's gonna kind of look to Grace and say, "So, I, I you you've kind of brought up before and referred to me as the person who used the true name and how it's a big issue. I'm guessing using the true name is a bigger issue than just what actually went down between me and Lady Nim, right? I mean, do you know what it is? Do you know what you did? I I get the grasp that." kind of controls like a celestial or a fiend or like can make them do something for a moment but do you know why because like there's magic that does that but like magic is magic it's just like creating something out of nothing or destroying something into nothing it's just like it's just moving things around right molecules chemistry i read a book i don't know i made a shark the other day yeah that's magic it's just like there isn't something so you make something it's like magic, the definition of magic, um, if I can quote from my encyclopedia that I got for my 35th birthday, <laughs> is like the violation of the conservation of energy through ritual. If you if you could see it, steam would be shooting out of Zoe's ears. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we've established that Zoe is dyslexic, but have never really referenced it. She she probably doesn't love reading, right? <laughs> no, I, I imagine she when she was like, "What kind of books do you like?" And she's like, "I assume it's like one kind, but I'll just be specific just in case." <laughs> <laughs> okay, here you go. I brought all the books in Ilium. These are all phone books. <laughs> uh, so Grace says. Uh, ch- True naming something isn't the same as just casting magic on it. It's I like the way my dad explained it is like, so you know how like people call you Zoe, right? Um, yeah. Because that's just a thing we all decided that you're called. And then you like write it in letters, Z-O-E-Y. And when you look at that, you know it's Zoe, right? But it, they're just squiggles and blobs and we just decided they mean a thing. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess that makes sense. Like, there's nothing about you that is inherently Zoe, and there's nothing about the letters that make up the word Zoe that are inherently Zoe. But, like, true names are the things. Like, like, like we're getting to, like, some interesting metaphysics conversation here. (laughs) Just, like... I... (laughs) Hello, I'm Austin Yorsky. You might not know me. (laughs) (laughs) Metaphysics. Um... (laughs) But like when you true name somebody, you're you're not saying like this is a Zoe or like this means Zoe. It's like the actual thing. Does any of that make sense? Kind of. So was it like really dangerous that I used it? It's like magic is setting something on fire. True names are like the actual burning. Does that make sense? It's the concept of burning instead of just the making of burning happen. Zoe's gonna like kinda like have her like uh like her hand to her chin, like deep in thought, and uh she's gonna say, I don't totally get it. I'm sorry, but um <laughs> I do get the sense that I don't fully understand it, but that it it's really important to you. So for that, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't I didn't mean to kind of, like, go outside the norm on anything. I was just trying to protect me and my sister. Oh, I mean, you don't have to apologize to me. It was mostly my dad who was mad. I don't really fully understand it myself, but it seemed like it really bothered him. Yeah, I, I'm probably doing a lot that's really bothering your dad, so... <laughs> All right, so on that note, uh, let's cut back into the mirror, uh, where the team is on the edge of a breakthrough. <laughs> so you put metal in my body... So now you have to talk about your feelings. I feel like I want to get out of here and kick that angel's ass. No, we need to get deeper. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> I have a question for you. You want to kick his ass, right? Right to the moon. I want to kick his ass and his butt flies off and goes into space. Okay, okay. 
and you've been trapped in this mirror for like decades, right? I I mean, I guess. Yeah. So that's that's decades that you weren't able to enact your plan to kick his ass, right? Right? Are you with me? Yeah. So do you regret the fact that you've had to spend decades not being able to kick his ass? That that's not that's not <laughs> relevant to why he's in here. I regret not kicking his ass. Yeah, you regret that you did things that led to you not being able to kick his ass. <laughs> so, do you regret the actions that led to you being in here that stopped you kicking his ass? No, I only I only regret that I didn't win. <sighs> Fine. I mean, did you ever even consider the fact that maybe your uncle wanted to like come here? Did you ever think about his feelings? I mm because it sounds like you just kind of thought about your own feelings and that you wanted your uncle back, but maybe you should have thought about that he was happy here with his stupid angel boyfriend. <laughs> uh, persuasion check. Oh, I botched! Oops. If that was really the case, then he should have just let me talk to him. Then I could, I would know. But you broke down his door. You kicked in the door. That's the, that, them is fighting... Action, son. Hey, hey, look. How's how, how's about this for a theory? You you are worried. You were worried about Lucas having been taken forcefully, right? Or coerced, I guess. Light was worried about the same. You broke into his home. You kicked down that door. We're not gonna know this for much longer. Uh, we we kind of made a bit of a deal that went on, but uh, he's he's got a daughter up there, who's like half gnome. I'm pretty sure they had a kid. And he, I can understand Light being protective and worried about people breaking into his home. Sure, we broke into his home earlier today, <laughs> but like we didn't know at the time. But can you, can you understand the thought of someone coming into your house, kicking down the door, and you being worried about them taking Lucas, and why the response there might be to try and protect yourself by sticking someone in it doing something like putting someone in prison to try and save someone important to you. So, Mardis turns away from Voltari and kind of walks over to where the chess table is set up, and he waves a hand, and you see the scene kind of rearrange itself, and this time it is the ground floor of the sacrum, and you see Mardis charging in, he <laughs> kicks the front door open, you know, swords drawn, He's like, I'm here to save you, Uncle Luke. <laughs> and he's running and he kicks the next door and it doesn't actually open because there's chains all around it. <laughs> and then that door opens as Warden Light comes out and he tries to push past him and they're scuffling. And then the scene freezes and Mardis waves his hand again. And the roles in the scene are exchanged. This time it's Warden Light kicking in the door and it's Mardis Valaman trying to defend his family. Yeah, see, I, I know you thought you were doing good, but look, this is this is the point where I just like try and slyly give both Roland and Dora just like a smug look of like, yeah, two for two, did the uh... thing, prison break. <laughs> Dora's gonna cut holes in all her clothes later. Yeah, to take away her swagger. Uh, can you make sure they're at least like eyeball shaped clothes or like bats or something? Make them so, like a cool shape. <laughs> you said. You said he has a daughter? Uncle Luke has a daughter? Yeah, nice kid. I can't even, like, hold that information in my head. It's so... Well, you're not alone in that regard, because as soon as we get out of here, we're not going to be able to uh, hold it in our heads. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I I mean, I, I want to meet her. If Uncle Luke is gone, then she's she doesn't even know anyone from her family. That's that's on you and Light, because we, we're not going to be able to help you with that. You're going to have to talk to Light. What is it that you want right now? I guess I want to meet my niece. She would be your cousin if that was your... Yeah. We have much simpler words in Elvish than to refer to family members. Common is clumsy. Sorry. Mm, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, I know what I can do. I want to cast Disguise Self. There we go. That'll do it. Uh, do you want to read that? Uh, yeah, I make myself, including clothing and belongings, look different for up to an hour until I dispel it. Uh, I can have up to one foot of height difference, so 
I I might not be able to get exactly to her height, but I can, you know, I'll approximate as best I can. Um, I have to have the same basic limb arrangement, which I think we do, if I remember right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> ho- horns aren't limbs, are they? I can, like, disguise my horns. It doesn't hold up to physical inspection, but, you know... No, it's not really applicable to the situation. So basically, I, I change my appearance to look like Grace, or as best I can. So Viltara, you change to look like Mardis Valamin's cousin, Grace Rosemary, and his face undergoes a change because he can see his uncle in Grace, and he's clearly filled with emotion, and he, he definitely wants to get out. He's always wanted to get out, but... Mardis, what is it that you want? I... <sighs> I just want, I just want to be with my family. Well, you may have lost one member of your family. You might have gained one, and potentially two members of your family, just outside this mirror. I know you didn't mean to, but you tried to tear a loving set of fathers apart. Dora's just like eating popcorn. <laughs> she carries popcorn with her wherever she goes. This young girl's already lost one father. Don't make her lose a second. Uh, Mardis kind of steps forward and hugs you, and he simply says, I'm sorry. I I didn't think. I was selfish. I'm sorry. And at this point, the mirror world dissolves, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, the prison collapses, and you guys are spewed out onto the stairs. Uh, dexterity saving throw everybody to not plummet ten stories down. <laughs> can I not just levitate? Yeah, you can mel- You can absolutely levitate. Uh, six. I botched. And I crit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Roland, you come out, and you land on your feet perfectly. Uh, so you have the opportunity to grab Veltari as she goes ass over tea kettle <laughs> over the, flo- the floating stained glass sta- stairs. There's a slight montage in his mind of all the moments <laughs> Veltari has been smug about <laughs> being better than him at every opportunity. And then he just helps her. Perfect. So Theodore is floating. Uh, Mardis is fine. And then Roland grabs Veltari as she falls over the edge and just holds her up with one arm. And Light is looking at you guys. Yo. Hey. We did it. We we did it again. We're pretty good with this whole uh, mirrors thing. <laughs> Suck on that. Do you want me to play as Mardis now at this point, or...? Yeah, if you want. Yeah, make make sure in your first line speaking as him, uh, Skitch, that you, like, talk about his love of manga. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like Mardis, like, when he's out of the mirror, he looks to light, and the first instinct is for his hand to sort of, like, reach to his side to where the pistol's holstered, but light can almost sense Mardis sort of stopping himself from going off of reflex. You know, 50 years of training yourself to kind of get back at the angel in the first sight. It's a little hard to kind of break out of it first. And then Mardis just sort of looks to the angel, uh, his lower lip quivers a bit, and then he sort of lunges in to light, uh, basically to just to just hug him with his face sort of buried into light's shoulder uh, as he as the best way to describe it is sobs gently right there while embracing the angel. Light embraces him back, and then he says to the avant guards after a moment, "If you could give us a moment." Um, I trust that I can count on you to wait in the chapel. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dora's just going to float out. <laughs> Roland will carry Voltari down. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like, just like, she's hanging off the edge, like he just holds her arm, just sort of walks down the steps. <laughs> Aren't you going to help me up? No. That's an amazing image. Um, so, uh, Light takes Mardis up to the top of the tower and after a while of you guys waiting downstairs, he s- sends Zoe down to meet with the rest of you. Before he comes down, I do want to do something. All right. Uh, I want to just like squirrel myself away to a little bit of a corner in the chapel. Mm-hmm. And I want to cast on, on my guitar, Magic Mouth. Oh, Veltari! <laughs> <laughs> Is... 
I, I won't do this if you don't want me to, Austin. No, of course. But... Listen, abs- listen, if I ever try to talk you out of something <laughs> that smart, you quit the show. Don't let me do that to you. Okay, so, like, I want to utter to this... Uh... Yeah, explain to the audience what Magic Mouth does. So basically, like, I can, I can give a message to an object within a 30-foot range, and when I do something to trigger that that item a mouth will appear on it and just sort of utter the phrase that I said to it. Um, I have to be able to see the item. It has to not be worn or carried by another creature. 25 words or less over 10 minutes. Uh, I choose the trigger conditions. And this mouth, just like at my voice and volume, will say what I said to it. And just as sly as I can be in the chapel, I just want to say to my guitar, Warden Light has a daughter named Grace. I have I have to set a-, a condition for it, and the condition I'm going to set is uh, when I am in my room by myself. <sighs> Guys, <laughs> Laura's better at this game than me. <laughs> <laughs> it-, it helps when you're willing to, like, do some slightly immoral things to, to-, to do what you need to do. Oh, dear. <laughs> Shenanigans, tomfoolery, <laughs> shenanigans, ding dongs. Um, can can I just like throw out here? I'm not doing this for like actual malicious reasons. For once, like it's it's an easy choice for me to make in that like I'm happy to break a promise I made to Warden Light as part of this deal. But I'm making it for what I think is the right reasons, which is like, hey, my whole plan here was to like go in and like take control of Warden Light fully for 24 hours. And like, the fact he's got a daughter is something I should probably factor into that, you know. So after Viltari is done whispering to her guitar, which is one one of many perfect mental images this <laughs> session has brought us. It's fine. If anyone had really caught me, my excuse was going to be I was jotting down a song about being in the mirror. There's a Black Mirror joke in there and I lost it. <laughs> Warden Light comes down with Zoe, who rejoins the group. Uh, Mardis and Grace are not with him. And he says, uh, Avant-Garde, thank you. You have done my family an enormous kindness today. It will take some time to heal wounds and make amends, but we have time. And I am eternally grateful. I, I am glad to know that we continue to be the best break people out of mis- in, in Mirror Prison people uh, around. I, I know we had, like, an agreement on this, like, no no worries if not. This might just, like, get me out of a tough situation. You don't want to throw in, like, a really expensive gemstone while you're at it for, like, thanks, because we did this whole thing. <laughs> All the gemstones I have access to are material components for constructing the mirror, so I'm afraid not. It, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm working on another, on another case. We're trying to do a thing. It's all good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I suspect that Mardis is going to be staying here in the tower for the time being he is capable of taking care of himself he can safely walk around ilium but i prefer for now if he stay close to home tell him to come visit my turtle sometime (laughs) Uh, i will relay that message uh in the meantime i suppose we should finish conducting our business i will dispel the quarantine that I've placed within my mind and then relay that information to you. So here we go, I guess. <laughs> you don't really see Warden Light laugh much, but he's having a very strange day. Uh, so he actually does kind of like chuckle there and he holds a hand up to the side of his head and his hand glows with a kind of warm, kind light and he holds it up to his temple. And then after a moment, he brings it down and He looks at the four of you, and then he says, No, 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 no. Come on. Like, the the sooner you tell us this, the sooner that we can re-quarantine it and the weight is on us, not you. It's... nothing matters. It's all a lie. Nothing matters. No. Uh Uh, Can I do a medicine check to see if there's anything I can do to help him through whatever he's experiencing right now? Uh, yeah. Eleven. 
Uh, Viltara, you start walking towards him, just kind of looking at what's happening because he's holding his hands to his head and he's kind of like writhing in place. Yeah. And you kind of reach out because you're trying to get a better look. And all of a sudden, a chain bursts out of a portal and just whips at you. Okay, let's let's not get closer. Uh... Does 15 hit your AC? Uh, yes, it hits AC. You take five damage, and then another chain bursts through a different portal and slams down in front of him, crushing the pulpit, which explodes in a shower of shrapnel. What? Warden Light falls to his knees, still holding his head, and from his back, both of his wings unfurl, tearing his robe. And you see, for the first time, his flawless white feathered wings stretch out behind him. And more and more chains are beginning to pour into the room and flailing wildly, tearing apart pews. Okay, uh, Roland is going to try to you know drop to his knees and sort of rest his hands on Light's shoulders and console him as well as he can, given well what's happening around. All right, you try to get close enough to Light to touch, and you nineteen hit your AC. Yes. All right. This is standard roll and no sell in business going on here, so... Yeah, you take seven damage, which is basically nothing to roll in, so I assume you block it with your shield or something, and it just hurts with uh, the impact. Mm -hmm. Um, And you walk over and you try to comfort him, and he's just saying again and again, no, 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 no. Can I use detect thoughts and probe into his mind? Mm Mm-hmm. To try and to go as deep as I can and see what it is that's going on that he's panicking about. Uh, oh, so you're going deep? Yeah, I want to go deep. Uh, 17. You, yeah, yeah, you resist that. So he resists the deep dive, but you get the surface in the, the quick glimpse of his thoughts right now that you get when you're trying to detect thoughts. You see he is standing before three figures wreathed in radiant light absolutely incandescent with pure holiness. It's hard to even look at them, but you see well, there's one One of the figures is missing a hand. One of the figures has his hands tied by cords. That's the, that's the triad, isn't it? Yes. Yes. And you see he's like having an audience with them. They're, they're telling him something. Whatever they're telling him is too awful to hear. And his mind is desperately trying to push it down. Roll in while you know sitting sitting down before light and hearing him in this panicked and frightened state um, casts heroism. All right, you want to tell us what that does? Heroism imbues a willing creature with bravery, which means until the spell ends, the creature is immune to being frightened and gains temporary hit points. But <clears throat> the primary thing is that it makes him immune to being frightened. All right, so you with your hand on his shoulder, trying to comfort him, imbue him with uh, the fortifying will to overcome the whatever awful truth is inside of him. Um, Your hand glows and it flows over him and he stops panicking long enough to look over to you and Warden Light says, if you you want to know what the Aurora is, just, just ask her. Just ask who? Her. The Aurora. The Aurora itself. But who is the Aurora? (laughs) We are mice. The gods are cats. She is the mountains. And we only scurry across her surface. Do you want to stop suffer, stuff, suffering with what you know? Give us a straight answer for once. The Triad sent me here, sent us here with this tower because they're scared. The gods are scared of this, this thing, the Aurora, things like it. They can't even come close to harming it, to threatening it. All we can do is hold it, hold it in place. That's what this tower is. Even even if Torm, Tyr, and Ilmater are scared, that doesn't mean we have to be. It doesn't mean that we can't face it, whatever it is. How can you be so sure? How can you be so brave in the face of something that makes the gods tremble? It is because I have no other choice. 
Dora was going to be like, I ain't scared. I ain't scared of nothing. <laughs> I ain't scared of no gods. As always, I'd like to thank Overclock Remix for our theme music, including Acoustic Jam with the Lucifer Alpha, an arrangement of Biohazard from Snatcher, Mystic Chemicals, an arrangement of Mystic Cave Zone and Chemical Plant Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog, and Simply Be Grooved, an arrangement of Simple and Clean from Kingdom Hearts. If you want to help support the show, you can contribute at patreon.com slash austinyorski. You can find Chris at patreon.com slash weekly manga recap, and you can find Laura at patreon.com slash Laura K Buzz. Executive producers for the month of August 2017 are Kerstine Haslinger, Jade, Extellaris, Joseph Timbrello, The Cult of Gorfanax, Irving Royale, Ken Fursell, Andrew Grothen, Paul Mullen, Luke Powers, Michael Goodell, Brent, Anthony Savier, Aki Savalainen, Iso, the Paladin's Wife, Florian, Charm Wilkie, Komano, The Future Mrs. and Mr. Hadsell, Dominic Bowden, Melissa Nielsen, Don, Eugene T., Connor Reynolds, Sarah Likens, Pruitt Holcomb, Artemis BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in Bristol, Francois V., Tarka, Shyness, Dennis Pancake Detlefsen, Ripter Stormwolf, Miko from Finland, Dennis Bangston, Josh Mosier, Indigo Van Dane, Sydney Marzing, Just a Jester, John Potts, Kevin Dobbins, Savarden Akrasimova, Brady Warner, Kitty Foe, James Neely, Marissa Donaldson, Melanie Joe, Lana Seawolf, Toby Gleason Stack, Ruby Offer, Matthew Weber, Sarah Hanley, Melissa Booker, Cameron Abbas, Dylan, Gary Sayon, Anna Stulfar, Sean, the host of Funk Dunk Plays, Giorgio Renna, Harrison Andrew, Kevin Sidlow, Christopher Charlo, Jorit, Viger Arnston, Cody Jackson, August Rue, Athos, and Ingmar Gremmen. Even if you can't contribute directly, you can always help support the show by finding us on Podbean, iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else podcasts are uploaded, and like, subscribe, or just tell your friends. You'd think I'd be better at advertising by now, but even after seven years, I have no idea how to get people to listen to my stuff. Maybe I'll figure it out after another seven years. By which time this show will be about laser sword fighting goblins on the surface of the sun.